This video is made in collaboration with the Seriously Wrong Podcast. Seriously Wrong Podcast is an awesome show that explains social ecology, communalism, and library socialism in a brilliant way. You can find the Seriously Wrong Podcast at srslywrong.com or at Apple Podcasts. So on my channel, we've talked a lot about the content of anarchism. We talked about the abolition of state, money, and class. We've talked about decentralization mutual aid and confederalization. We've talked about autonomy, self-sufficiency, and climate change, and we've talked a lot about the systems that we want to see in a future society and why we want to see those things, and even how they would work. But today we're going to do something a little bit different. Instead of looking at the content of anarchism, we're going to be looking at the form. What shape does anarchism take in real life? What does an anarchist society actually look like? And what are the physical changes we need to make to bring that society into reality? Hi, my name is Aaron, this is my show Reeducation, and today we're going to talk a little bit about what an anarchist city could look like. So with all that being said, let's get into it. So there's been a lot of talk lately online about the shape of our current modern cities. Comparisons between density and sprawl. Talk about the abolition of the suburbs, gentrification, anti-homeless architecture, eco-friendly transportation, self-driving cars, underground tunnels for rich people, and a whole host of other things related to the structure of a city. Most of this conversation comes out of the very real fact that we currently are facing a climate emergency, and if we don't do something soon, then it's game over for humanity. Many great minds are trying to find new technologies and innovations within our current mode to transform the city and reduce our impact on nature. But I want to propose that humanity and nature are not separate entities, but in fact all part of the same system. We are not separate from nature because everything that exists in the natural world is, by definition, nature. And for us to change the path that we are on, we have to start living ecologically and sustainably with that nature. Essentially, we have to rethink how we view cities themselves, and reconstruct them accordingly. Our current view of the modern metropolis is seen less as a means for social interaction, and more as a giant machine built for consumption. Once, cities and towns in America were built around extraction of resources and production of commodities, but since globalization and the outsourcing of commodity production, the modern metropolis primarily focuses on importation, distribution, and sale of commodities in many sectors, while others focus on the service and hospitality industry or recreation and gambling, essentially focusing on the monetization of hospitality, game playing, natural geography, and architecture. This means that instead of cities and towns being built around a factory or some sort of natural resource, or God forbid, human interaction, they are built on long stretches of highway peppered with big box stores, strip malls, fast food joints, and gas stations. In the larger cities and towns, it almost resembles a strip mall slicing through the center of an infinitely sprawling suburb all of which is densely packed with advertising and bright-colored plastic signs denoting capitalist businesses along the road. While once people in a community were able to congregate in some sort of town square or main street that was within walking distance from their house, we now go to malls or drive in our own isolated box to one of a thousand indistinguishable retail outlets along an unwalkable stretch of parking lots and freeway. This makes sense in our world because, in a consumption-based economy, the physical geography of that society is going to focus itself around consumption. But what if we didn't focus our society around consumption? What if we focus society around mutual aid, cooperation, and living ecologically and sustainably with our planet? In more concrete terms, what tantalizing issues does social ecology raise for our time and our future? In establishing a more advanced interface with nature, will it be possible to achieve a new balance between humanity and nature by sensitively tailoring our agricultural practices, urban areas, and technologies to the natural requirements of a region and its ecosystems? 
Can we hope to manage the natural environment by a drastic decentralization of agriculture, which will make it possible to cultivate land as though it were a garden balanced by diversified fauna and flora? Will these changes require the decentralization of our cities into moderate-sized communities, creating a new balance between town and country? All of which are great questions, and many of which are actually answered by something known as social ecology. Social ecology is an idea that was created by Murray Bookchin, and today we're going to dream of utopia and imagine what an anarchist city could look like in the future. And to start off, we're going to talk about density versus sprawl. If there is a large, dense population in a centralized location like a modern city, their needs would outweigh the amount of space they have to produce food, forcing them to rely on the countryside for its sustainability. Fewer people would be physically able to work the land because they would have to travel long distances outside of their city. This enforces the division of labor through physical geography. This would also incentivize monoculture, as more land outside of the cities would be needed to feed the entire population. For the capitalist, monoculture in this situation is easier because you can use large, specialized industrial machinery to harvest a whole lot of one specific type of plant, rather than smaller, more diverse technological methods using more people or machines that would inevitably increase cost. But what this doesn't actually factor in is externalities. This increases transportation cost and food waste due to spoilage. It also increases pollution and the amount of garbage thanks to packaging for shipment, refrigeration trucks, use of locomotives, cargo ships, etc. Not to mention, centralized cities have centralized dumping grounds, creating more waste in one single area. Centralized power stations needing to produce fantastic amounts of energy for single areas instead of smaller, more diverse sources of power generation available in that area. Centralized industry creates incredible amounts of pollution and disrupts ecosystems, not to mention the traffic. So clearly there are some serious problems with density. But density isn't necessarily all bad. The question is how we use it. What social ecology would emphasize is this. Democratic participation and basic needs for all, with ecological practices always followed and a confederated decision-making structure which starts at the local level with any given decision. The local level could be different floors of an ecologically optimal apartment building, or it could be towns across the countryside. The same democratic and ecological principles would apply in either context. So the question really isn't weather density, but rather what type of density? Is it built according to ecological principles on a participatory basis? Is it built for profit or luxury, or to provide for people's needs? This is where the rubber meets the road on density or sprawl to me. It's important to note that density can be used to our advantage if it's not allowed to get out of control. For instance, it costs more energy and human effort to turn on a hundred different stoves and have a hundred different people producing a hundred different meals than it does to have a handful of people work together to produce a large meal made to feed 100 people. It takes less energy and human effort to heat a single building with many rooms than it does to heat many separate buildings of the same size. Now, to solve this, it might be helpful in these cases to consider vertical cities or the conversion of existing high-rises into vertically structured, self-sustaining communities, essentially working to convert separate floors of a building to sustain different types of, say, agriculture, small production, distribution, food preparation, and living space. This would mean that even though a lot of these entities would be densely packed, they would also create and maintain their own ecosystem. If everything is closer together, you don't have to go so far away to get to it. And it takes less time for the goods produced there to get to you. Of course, converting old structures doesn't really do anything for reclamation of the natural habitat or the revival of the previously existing ecosystems, now paved over by massive sprawl or cityscapes. But this can be slowly reduced if new development projects are geared towards building self-sustaining ecological communities 
and reducing aimless density and sprawl. Large areas of land filled with big box stores like Walmart could be converted into massive greenhouses, and rural areas currently used for monocrop farmland could be converted into ecologically sustainable communities or returned back to their natural state. And the best possible thing that we can do with the suburbs is stop building them immediately. The suburbs create a fantastic amount of strain on the land, and they throw any balance of density versus ecology completely out the window. Suburban areas could even be reworked to incorporate a certain amount of sustainability and humanity as well, if within those infinite cul-de-sacs, they were able to convert some of the houses into food stores, workshops, restaurants, and the vast amount of yard space into land for food production and agriculture, turning those cute little cul-de-sacs into small, walkable townlets. Power Generation The massive number of individual houses in the suburbs does create a lot of problems, but we can also use them to a certain advantage. Massive amounts of houses means a massive number of roofs covering a ton of surface area. This space could be used to mount solar panels and other thermal energy collecting mechanisms that could create a sustainable source of power for that community, or even an excess that could be shared with other communities. We could convert our current large interconnecting power grid to accommodate multiple sources of energy production and storage to share power across a vast area. Also, in the cities and towns, different methods could be used to capture and generate power through the physical structure of the city itself. Heat and wind could be captured through the corridors between buildings, or the building envelope, particularly the facade, could be designed to recover heat and generate electricity. Also, considering there are many different forms of energy production that we could use outside of fossil fuels, each town and city could work to harness naturally occurring forms of energy generation within their area. For instance, harnessing tidal flows in areas close to a bay, or solar and wind generation in areas in large expanses of land, geothermal and hydro in other places, and finding new ways to recycle heat and waste products by human activity. If we were to, say, set up these vertical cities or adapt skyscrapers and high-rises to be more self-sustaining, the energy waste and heat produced by the various elements of society could even be harnessed as well. Energy could be extracted from biomass, plant and animal waste, that could be processed to be safely used to fertilize plants. Plants naturally produce oxygen, which is awesome because we all need to breathe. Not to mention the production of food. Human activity could even be harnessed through floor pads that convert the kinetic energy of walking into actual electricity. Physically changing the design of our architecture for new buildings to do things like harness natural wind currents or collect moisture from the air, along with windows and glass that could focus heat and light, clever HVAC systems that could transfer that heat to where it's needed, and maybe even putting a few more plants on the exterior of the buildings because it looks beautiful. And also it helps to capture CO2, something we clearly need to do. We just have to figure out some way to deal with those pesky mosquitoes. And of course, in some situations, we could even consider nuclear, but that's a whole other can of worms, and I really don't think I have time to explain it here. Transportation. The transportation of people and goods accounts for about 25% of total world delivered energy consumption. Light duty vehicles account for 44% of that followed by 11% for aircraft and 6% accounted for buses, two and three wheeled vehicles, and rail combined. The other 39% is all freight models, including trains, planes, and automobiles. No, uh, ships, actually. Freight trucks themselves make up the largest share at 23%, followed by marine vessels at 12%, and rail and pipelines combined to equal 4%. And if that's how much energy they use, just imagine how much pollution this creates. Let's get away from the numbers for a second. Much of this traffic 
is completely needless. We currently transport material and goods across the world because capitalists are able to extract, refine, produce, and distribute goods more cheaply by exploiting the labor of workers in one area and selling the commodities produced to another. The environmental impact is never considered because it doesn't directly affect the bottom line of the transportation industry. Like I said before, Noam Chomsky calls these externalities. Also, individual means of transportation is incentivized over public or communal transportation, which leads to more individual motors powering more individual cars transporting more individual people, essentially restating the conflict of density we talked about earlier. We know that it takes less energy to fuel or power one large vehicle transporting many people than it does many individual vehicles transporting the same number of people. Massive expansion of modern public transportation would have to be implemented as to reduce the number of vehicles on the road. Rail lines could be converted to accommodate mass transit across long distances connecting desperate communities and far-off cities currently only reachable by road. For really no fucking reason. Like seriously, they've already had this in Europe for over a hundred years. This increase in public transit will incentivize people to use their personal vehicles less frequently. Since 50 to 60% of urban land is specifically dedicated to accommodating cars, along with 5% of urban land specifically used for parking lots, a reduction in the number of vehicles would allow for fewer parking lots within large cities, and even a reduction in the number of drivable roads that are necessary. These vast swaths of pavement could be converted and opened up for green space or pasture land, and a reduction in the number of drivable roads in a strategic way as not to impede navigation could even allow us to open up those roads for foot traffic, and even narrowing the streets allowing for more green space on each side of the road. Highways themselves are not exactly known for reducing traffic. But in fact, they often increase it, as many people having to travel from one end of the city to the other will, instead of going different directions, choose the exact same road. The atomization and distribution of different sectors of society through zoning creates the necessity to transport long distances for work and leisure. The city is set up with an industrial zone, a commercial zone, a residential zone, surrounded by vast expanses of monocropped farmland atomized even to the specific seed that grows within each hectare of agricultural property. Since this is the case, highways have become the fastest method of getting from one area to another, forcing our reliance on large freight vehicles to transport goods and the inability for the individual to access what they need or indeed where they work within their own community. But if cities and towns were more autonomous, walkable, and if more goods were produced and distributed locally, then energy consumption and waste production through transportation would be drastically reduced. We may not be able to demolish all of the highways all at once, but the decentralization and confederation of smaller independent communities along with reclamation projects could be pursued that would reduce our reliance on those highways. If your home, your job, your favorite restaurant, nightclub, water slide, and dog park were all built closer to you, then you would be able to walk to them and enjoy them more frequently. Moreover, if the food you ate and the products you use were produced and distributed locally through the use of local community agriculture, free stores, and libraries, our need for imports and exports would drastically decrease and we could save the transportation of goods for things that are very special and only able to be produced in certain places. Production and Consumption The United States is a highly industrialized country. In 2020, the industrial sector accounted for 33% of total U.S. energy consumption. According to MECS 2018, the combined energy use by six energy intensive manufacturing subsectors chemicals, petroleum and coal products, paper, primary metals, food, and non metallic material products 
equaled 16.9 quadrillion BTUs or 87% of total manufacturing energy consumption. The three largest energy consuming manufacturing subsectors, chemicals, petroleum and coal, and paper, combined consumed nearly 70% of total manufacturing energy use in 2018. That essentially means that your individual consumption is completely meaningless in comparison to the amount of pollution created by production. All of the plastic straws in the world wouldn't add up to even a sliver of what the chemical petroleum and coal industries produce. It continues to say that the United States is the top chemical producer in the world, accounting for nearly one-fifth of world production. The chemical industry is a keystone of the U.S. economy, converting raw materials such as oil, natural gas, air, water, metals, and minerals into more than 70,000 different products. Chemicals are used to make a wide variety of consumer goods, as well as thousands of products that are essential inputs to agriculture, manufacturing, computing, telecommunications, construction, and the service industry. The U.S. chemicals industry's end-use energy consumption, excluding electricity generation, transmission, and distribution losses, totaled almost 5.2 quadrillion BTUs in 2006 accounting for about 24% of all energy use in U.S. manufacturing, which is a staggering number. And would it surprise you to find out that the main chemical being produced is sulfuric acid used in agricultural fertilizer? It's produced by extracting sulfur to sulfur dioxide, then to sulfur trioxide before finally being fumed into sulfuric acid. This is an extremely high polluting process that is essentially being done for no reason. Instead of creating eco-friendly methods of producing food by, say, diversifying the agriculture and using the natural properties of certain vegetables and animals along with the climate and the geographic conditions to create a biodiverse ecosystem capable of creating an abundance, we have one single type of plant growing in a vast amount of field requiring us to supplement the soil with chemicals to keep them alive. The other two main chemicals produced are propylene and sodium hydroxide. Propylene being used primarily as another non-renewable fuel source and sodium hydroxide used in food additives and herbicides. Now, obviously, many of these chemicals are important for producing plastics, rubbers, medical equipment, and construction materials. But non-renewable fuel sources? Food additives? Herbicides? If the food that we produce is consumed locally, it doesn't need additives or preservatives. If we actually care about the health of our society and not packing our food full of dangerous fillers, then we have no need for the vast majority of these chemicals. And again, if we construct our food production system to complement the biodiversity of its natural surroundings, as opposed to infiltrating on them, we don't really have as much use for herbicides as we could use the different types of plants to complement the ecosystem and enrich our food resources. It has been known for hundreds, no, thousands of years that we can grow certain plants next to one another so they can provide nutrients into the soil, others so that they can ward away certain types of insects and attract pollinators. And we know that we can create smaller, more manageable facilities geared towards producing the highest quality and abundance of food for the least amount of environmental cost. We just simply don't do it because it's too much money. In a rational society, or an anarchist one like we're talking about, our reliance on transportation and non-renewable energy production would be reduced. So the amount of coal and petrol fuel would also greatly reduce. The reliance on these chemicals would also reduce greatly if we produced commodities locally, using local materials at a higher quality instead of mass-produced plastic crap designed to break or fall apart. Production for the sake of profit would be a thing of the past, replaced by consumption for the sake of need, enrichment, and joy. 
Why buy the cheapest set of chairs or the base model phone that will just snap or die because you can't afford a better one? If money didn't exist, you could have a well-built, timeless product made to last. And for things that we don't use all the time, like lawnmowers, fishing boats, ATVs, trailers, and hand tools, we could even have a place where people could access them communally, like a library. Of course, you could still own these things as personal items if you really wanted to, but you don't have to just to be able to use them. I know I have really no use for a pickup truck, but once in a while it would be nice to not have to look all over Kijiji to find a fucking truck. This is a modern adaptation of a social ecological premise known as usufruct, a form of property relationship based on distribution according to need. Or, in the words coined by the people at the Seriously Wrong podcast, library socialism. Of course, there are still some commodities and products that would be impractical or unsafe to produce in small scale or in local communities. Chemical plants, refineries, steel mills, and other loud, large-scale production plants will likely, in some capacity, still have to exist to create certain materials and equipment necessary for society to function. You really can't build an airplane, a train car, or a windmill out of your house. And specialized plastics and materials are always necessary for scientific and medical equipment and even medication. We would still require all these things. Just the same, some simple and basic commodities require far less energy to produce on a large scale than they do on the individual level. Again, that whole concept of efficiently utilizing density. Complicated electronics, pots and pans, light bulbs, and most building materials are among many things that are currently easier and more efficient and require even less energy to produce on a large scale than having an individual handicraftsman make those things themselves. Until 3D printing technology catches up, that is. So, while we're waiting, these industries should be geared towards building far higher quality products with better materials that are less likely to break so they last longer. If things last longer, we can produce less of them. An increase in quality and a reduction in unnecessary production will reduce the factories necessary to create those goods. If the intention of production is to switch from quantity to quality, we could also incorporate artists, designers, and different elements into the factory that would allow for the commodities that we produce to be more unique and beautiful. Instead of a car being produced solely for you to drive from work to home and spend 98% of the day parked, cars could be built for enjoyment and beauty. Instead of a thousand of the exact same sedan, each one could be its own personal art piece, or customized to reflect individual tastes. Recreation! As stated above, the current mode of capitalism finds ways to monetize social interactions as well as recreational activities. Campgrounds force you to pay to exist in nature, while anti-squatting laws prevent you from enjoying it naturally. Ordering food at a drive through divorces us from our naturally communal relationship to food, as well as participating in the division of labor from recreation, separating the joy of cooking, preparing, and providing nourishment to your community, and the consumption of that food in a transactionary manner. In other words, the chef is in the back hidden away, using her labor to produce commodities that are consumed in the front of house by a paying customer at an individual booth. You don't know them, they don't know you, the only relationship you have is through the exchange of currency. Nature reserves, amusement parks, water slides, art museums, bowling alleys, arcades, movie theaters, and essentially every other form of recreation in capitalism is pay to play. If not with upfront costs, then through microtransactions or hidden taxes. Even the roads you take to get there is either pay by toll or paid for in taxes. More still, what some people do as a hobby or for fun, others are forced to do for survival, while others, like artists and musicians, are completely unappreciated outside of a tiny handful of celebrities, 
leaving art and beauty behind a paywall or only for the privileged minority. The public sphere is filled with quickly constructible, semi-permanent, cheaply built modern buildings, with the motive always towards capitalist efficiency, homogeneity, and maximizing profit. Even restaurants, a place for associating and community, are made just comfortable enough not to be appalling while putting measures in place that will incentivize customers to buy things quickly and not stay very long. But when you ask most chefs, they will tell you that they're in the industry because they love their craft and they want to use their skills to feed people. If you ask an artist or a ballet dancer, they will tell you that they are in their industry because they want to entertain people and bring them joy or even express themselves. And when you ask the comedian, they'll tell you that they're in their industry because they want to make people laugh or think differently about things. These are not commodities to be bought and sold. These are communities, workers, people, all contributing to a fulfilling society. And the land is not a product. It should be there for everyone to enjoy it, freely as we always have. In a society that cherishes individuality, expression, art, music, literature, poetry, and all of the other things that bring meaning and joy to our lives, then we should expect to see small amounts of those things everywhere we go. Architecture not meant to be brutal and utilitarian, but beautiful and complementary to its surroundings, built to incorporate green space and leisure areas. Sculptures, artwork, and fountains should be everywhere that they are able to accentuate the beauty of society. Recreational activity and places for fun would be incorporated into every city block, with attractions and new inventions or even ideas being displayed or presented in the public sphere for all walks of life to enjoy. In an anarchist society, the jobs people decide to do can reflect their internal desire, rather than be meant to chase financial security. Your desire in a certain interest and contributing to it would inevitably add to the fulfillment of your life. If you're doing something that you love, it often doesn't feel like work at all. And if you're not forced to produce for profit, then you can really focus on enjoying that job. The lines between occupation and recreation would be so blurred that the two terms would essentially become meaningless outside of certain tasks we would have essentially abolished work and replaced it with fulfilling and purposeful labor. Conclusion A better society is achievable if we work for it. We have the resources today to create something beautiful in the future. Reappropriation and modification of inherited architecture, an infusion of the ecological into the city spaces, and new architecture which is designed to be highly ecological, efficient, and sustainable, which might include any number of forms, including dense buildings, perhaps forms we haven't even discovered yet, but density alone can't save us. It's the qualitative features of the density which matter most. We need socially directed housing made according to ecological practices and with educational and democratic institutions that allow community members to help shape its development. And it also seems likely to me that a social ecological utopia would have both areas that are more lived in by people and areas which are more wild. The areas which are more wild would have a sprinkling of people in ecological communities who could act as stewards. And that's true. And honestly, the ideas that we could come up with on how we could design our cities and our future are limitless. The way our cities and towns are currently structured are a direct reflection of the capitalist system. And indeed is the form the capitalist system takes in real life just as the cities in feudal times were the physical form of feudalism, everything focused around the church or the castle. The division of labor in the factory is identical to the division of labor within a country, just as in a factory there are different sectors, each one devoted to a specific task in the production of a commodity, so too is a city divided into different sectors through zoning. Agriculture in one area, production in another, commerce in another, housing in another, and so on and so on forever. We're not only alienated from our labor, 
were alienated from the whole of society. Everything within a capitalist system is geared towards being bought and sold, pay to use. Consumption is not only promoted as essential to acquiring goods and services, but also as a national pastime. Capitalists even find new clever ways of turning the simple things in life into pay to use services. Leisure, business, production, housing, all atomized and sectioned off into their own separate geographic areas. But living within a machine specifically tuned for consumption is not conducive to human growth. The capitalist system puts the vast majority of the economy that produces the goods we need to live in the background and places commerce and advertising right up front. The physical geography promotes the capitalist mode. But in an anarchist society, the shape and form of the city will reflect the anarchist mode, placing workers and nature and the community right up front. We don't need a machine for consumption. We need an organism that evolves and grows, and we are part of that organism. At least, that's the way I look at it. Thanks for watching. And special thanks again to Sean from the Seriously Wrong Podcast and Solar Punk Communalist on Twitter for pointing me in his direction. Uh, make sure to check out the Seriously Wrong Podcast on Apple Podcasts, specifically their trilogy on social ecology. It's absolutely fantastic, and I learned so, so much just listening to uh, one of the episodes. They interviewed seven contemporaries and collaborators of Bookchin, and it's incredible. It's super scientific. It's based in reality. It's based in uh, a lot of actual science and uh, I absolutely love it. And as well, don't forget to check out their trilogy on library socialism, a term I believe that they coined. Uh, and if so, cool. It's a great way to describe certain dynamics of a gift economy. So thank you very much. And as always, keep evolving.